Hey, hello, and welcome to Stan Energy Man. Stan Osterman here at Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, we're going to do a little combination of things today. Uh, number one, I wanted to talk about Hawaii and hydrogen and some of the, not only the history of Hawaii and what it's been doing in the hydrogen world that's impacted the, um, the whole hydrogen industry worldwide, but also focus on some of the people here in Hawaii that have actually worked with me and worked um, with the federal government um, to make hydrogen a reality. This is, so to start with, Hawaii's really a super unique place. I grew up here, um, moved here in 1959, was witness to Hawaii becoming a state in 1959. And my dad was a military officer, so we weren't expecting to live here our, our whole lives, but it turns out I, I pretty much did. I had to move away for a couple of years, but came back and finished school, high school and college and everything here and lived here ever since. But Hawaii is a really special place. It's a special place culturally. It's a special place climate wise. It's a special place geographically. Um, and I'd even say politically. It's um, probably a very conservative state with very liberal politics. So it's, it's really kind of a dichotomy in, in a lot of ways. The one thing I have noticed is that Hawaii is the origin of a lot of really great ideas, whether it's Asian martial arts movies or whether it's Chinese medicine, <clears throat> whether it's fusion cooking, um, it, it, go down the list. It, so many things that probably would have stayed where they originated became an international um, uh, phenomenon because of Hawaii. And, um, and we had our own batch of, I would call them inventions or, or things that um, impacted the world, the, the most notable being surfing, you know, a, the sport of kings in Hawaii that Duke Hanamoku, um introduced to the rest of the world. And it's, you know, it started off in California and the, the West Coast and turned into a lifestyle in the 60s, 50s and 60s by the 70s was pretty much nationwide, even on the East Coast. And then uh, not long after that, even in Europe where people were wearing super wetsuits and still trying to surf. And now surfing is found around the world, whether it's Portugal or Brazil, uh, Japan, uh, Indonesia, you name it. In fact, surfing is gonna be in the Olympics this uh, coming summer in Japan. It's finally made it to, to the Olympic stage. And of course, some of the competitors, the chief competitors and champions will be from Hawaii. Um, but the term wiki that you hear in Wikipedia or WikiLeaks, the term wiki or the, the word wiki in Hawaiian means quick. And so it was, it's on purpose that when you look at Wikipedia, it's the quick way to find things. It's a quick way to look something up. So we, we have the word licky licky or wiki, wiki wiki, which means quick or fast. So, you know, that has kind of been tapped on it. Even surfing the net, when you talk about the internet, surfing the net is a term that the word surfing came from Hawaii and now it's even applied to high tech um, internet stuff. Um, the word big, the phrase big kahuna, um, obviously, it's used more in a joking way of like whoever's in charge. Um, but, uh, you know, that's an old Hawaiian thing. Magnum PI, Hawaii Five-O, those shows were loved. And even before that, there was, um, there was uh, an old Hawaiian, um, before the first Hawaii, Hawaiian fi Hawaii Five-O, there was an old um, 60s show that was done in Hawaii. I don't even remember the name of it. It was the, the groundbreaking, um, idea for a Hawaii Five O show that was uh, based on on law enforcement. So we have some some great things that go on here, but a lot of people don't realize that some of the high technology and innovative things um, in the world center in Hawaii. We have tremendous um, telescopes on the island of Maui and the Big Island here in Hawaii that because of their location near the equator and their um, high altitude, they get incredible views of the universe that up until the Hubble telescope were just not obtainable. Um, so Hawaii's been in the 
observation, the space observation world for a long time. Um, one of my guests on the show here, um, uh, Hans, uh, oh shoot, uh, invented uh, ocean thermal, or actually did the design work for ocean thermal, which is being tested and, and refined at uh, the Natural Energy Laboratory in, down in Kona in no at Noha. So a lot of things have grown up in Hawaii, even high tech stuff. We're one of the few states that has an application in to be a spaceport. Um, we have we have high speed um, boats on our our lanes that the Army runs a high speed trimaran. A lot of the Navy's undersea research was done in Hawaii. A lot of the classified work done during World War II was actually done on the island of Niihau here in Hawaii because it's so remote and has no access from outside uh, people. You, you can't get there unless you go by helicopter or boat. And if you can surveil the, the shoreline, you're not getting in there. So the, the military had an agreement with uh, the inhabitants of the island of Niihau during World War II and after to develop classified things because it was such a perfect and isolated location in the middle of the of a US state or territory in the middle of a big ocean, which was hard to, to hide anything um, coming in or, come, or going out. So what I wanted to focus on though, of course, because my favorite subject is hydrogen. And a lot of people don't think about this, even in our state, don't realize that Hawaii has a, a pretty rich history in hydrogen going back into the 1970s. We had a, a congressman, then senator, named Spark Matsunaga, who uh, was actually in, in, the, in Congress before our more famous senator, Senator Daniel Inouye. <clears throat> and he introduced hydrogen, hydrogen technology, and the concept of a hydrogen economy to the state of Hawaii back probably in the 70s or 80s. And he really kind of planted the seed here. So later on, folks like Senator Inouye, who when he became more powerful in Congress and Senator Akaka, um, they really helped bring some of the more innovative um, uh, projects that related to hydrogen into being here in Hawaii. And one of them was a program called HCAT, Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies, which Senator Noy brought in probably, I don't remember exactly when it came in, it's probably around 2000, right around the year 2000. And um, that program is one that I was involved with for six years and has done some serious work, not just in hydrogen, but in electric vehicles overall. And the work that HCAT did way back in the early 2000s, um, tested all kinds of battery technologies. Um, we even had a 20 foot container that was literally a freezer that we could take down into many degrees below zero to test battery performance way below zero. And we also um, transitioned the battery electric program from HCAT into our state energy office and they began to handle the battery plug-in program. But at HCAT, we continued on with electric vehicles, but moved into the, the less known, um, but amazing technology known as hydrogen fuel cells and uh, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle technology. So we had some pretty visionary leaders in the state of Hawaii. Governor Linda Lingle was one of them. She was in office from 2002 to 2010. And um, she and Senator Akaka were at Hickam Air Force Base when HCAT and the Air Force built um, the first hydrogen station on a military base in, in the world. And um, it was pouring down rain that day. And there's some great video of the senator and the governor getting literally soaked because they had a, a nice awning over their head, except that the 15 to 20 mile an hour wind blew all the rain right past the awning and onto the VIP stage. So most of the people in the audience were nice and dry, but the poor folks, the VIPs on the stage were getting soaked. And of course, um, they were all dressed in suits and, and suit, you know, women's suits, uh, business suits, and they were, they were getting dumped on. But there was such a commitment here 
to support that research that the governor and Senator Kaka and Senator Inouye were big supporters of hydrogen, carrying on Spark Matsunaga's vision for the state of Hawaii to eventually move into a hydrogen economy. Um, in the mid 2000s, in 2006, 2007, 2008, while well, Governor Lingo was in, in, um, in the seat of government as a governor, she actually um, and the legislature uh, they worked together to formulate how hydrogen could develop uh, Hawaii's economy. Hawaii's always had an economy that was based on sugarcane and pineapple, tourism, and the military. Those were like the three legs of our economic stool here in Hawaii. Well, as most of you maybe not, aren't, don't realize, um, pineapple and sugarcane are all but non-existent in Hawaii. Dole still has a pineapple um, plantation uh, in central Oahu, that visitors can come and see what it was like on the old Hawaiian plantations. But it's really not a, a big cash drop in Hawaii like it once was um, the exported pineapples worldwide. And sugarcane is long gone. And sugarcane, believe it or not, was actually one of our earliest renewable resources to make electricity. Um, on all the islands, they would take the sugarcane bagasse, which was the remnants after they squeezed all of the juice out of the sugar cane. And they would use some of it for cattle feed, but they also would use a lot of it to burn for power. Um, of course, it's still a carbon-based fuel, so um, it, it pretty much went by the wayside with a lot of the other carbon burning um, technologies unless they were cleaned up. But it was one of our, not only an agricultural product we exported, but gave us some energy independence as well. But we moved into the hydrogen piece in the mid 2000s, uh, 2005, six, seven, eight, um, and actually had some funding set up called the um, Hydrogen Fund, which was $10 million to start doing hydrogen and build a hydrogen economy so that Hawaii could become less dependent on fossil fuel technology. And it never quite got off the ground. Um, the original $10 million um, was allocated. And when it was sent into the executive branch of the government, um, there were problems with executing the, the uh, they brought in um, mainland investors and mainland consultants to help get things going. And some of them had checkered pasts and checkered uh, motivations. And um, it ended up turning into more of a scandal than anything else. And I, I think that one piece of Hawaiian history and hydrogen pretty much killed um, the appetite for hydrogen, especially after Governor Lingle um, stepped away from office and most of the Democratic Party was pretty much fed up with anything having to do with hydrogen. And to this very day, it's still hard to get the political folks in Hawaii to, to really uh, look at hydrogen the way they should, seriously, uh, based on its merits and its technology without um, thinking about some of the shenanigans that went on with some of the early funding. But that was, that's getting us up into the, the time we're at now in the, you know, 2010 and beyond. Um, Hawaii's done a lot of great work with, with hydrogen research. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman. And we're just talking about hydrogen history in Hawaii. And um, I got you up through the 
20, 2008 to 2010 timeframe. And that's actually where I kind of jumped into the picture in my own career um, and focused on hydrogen. Although I'd been involved in clean energy for several years, um, about that time in my career, like around 20, 2008, um, 2006, is when I started working um, with the state of Hawaii as a military officer on the National Guard side um, and working clean energy projects with US Pacific Command um, and the state of Hawaii. I was senior enough in the National Guard to um, be considered a point of contact for US Pacific Command. Um, and I worked a lot with the J-8, um, Dr. Kai Levi, and some of the folks at US Pacific Command on energy and clean technology. We talked about undersea cables. We talked about wind turbines. We talked about um, trying to get all of the military bases ahead on clean energy. And by the way, they are here in Hawaii, you can't go in a military base and not see a whole lot of photovoltaic and even some wind and at Kaneohe Marine Base, they even have um, ocean-based uh, power generation, wind, wind uh, generation and wave generation um, experiments going on from time to time offshore of, of the Marine Base. But a lot went on, a lot of it was unnoticed or, or not really, um, most people weren't aware of it, but a lot was going on. The Army put in a 65 kilogram a day hydrogen station up at Schofield. Um, and we had one, HCAT had one installed at Hickam Air Force Base. Again, a 65 kilogram a day station. Um, after that, um, the University of Hawaii's um, HNEI and Mitch Ewan put in a station at the Marine Base at Kaneohe. A little bit smaller, I think theirs is 12 kilograms a day. But the military was actually testing quite a few vehicles in Hawaii um, that use hydrogen fuel cell technology. And we basically uh, gave the military their first picture of what hydrogen vehicles could do in the DOD. Um, and to this day, we're kind of known as the seed for the Department of Defense in, in the United States to really bring recognition uh, to the military of of the hydrogen advantages to hydrogen technology in the military. <clears throat> so we got those those things started. We ma we made vehicles. We made flight line vehicles for the Air Force. We designed a microgrid for Hickam. They used uh, hydrogen for energy storage and resiliency and redundancy, um, and did a lot of great things. But being that this uh, past week was Thanksgiving. Um, I thought it might be really kind of neat to highlight some of the folks and talk a little bit about what they did in Hawaii to facilitate some of these great projects in Hawaii. Uh, one is uh, a lady who's actually on the show with Jay Fidel from time to time, named Mina Marita, who was an early hydrogen promoter, I think a frustrated hydrogen promoter back in the mid 2000 to 2008 timeframe. And she's one of the folks that worked with, um, in the Lingo administration and at the PUC to help get hydrogen started in the state. And so she did a, a great bit of work. I think she just kind of got burned out on hydrogen because no pun intended. Um, she worked really hard at it and got beat up pretty bad for it. I mentioned Mitch Ewan at HNEI. He actually has a background in developing um, uh, hydrogen fuel cell transportation. Some of the very first vehicles in the United States ever built with hydrogen fuel cell technology were built by Mitch. Um, and he continues to work at the University of Hawaii, um, supporting that station on the Marine base, supporting another station he just basically built on, from scratch on the Big Island to help support um, what were initially buses being made for the National Park Service, um, but also one being made for the County of uh, Hawaii and will be hopefully turned into the starting um, transition for that whole bus service on the Big Island to go to hydrogen technology. Um, another Big Island uh, supporter that's still really active and helping uh, move things along in the Big Island is Paul Pontio from Blue Planet Research. Um, he's a wizard and has a whole team of really, really, really smart folks who are internationally known for their work in hydrogen fuel cell technology and um, lithium ferrous phosphate batteries, which um, I think are far superior to lithium, lithium 
lithium cobalt technology. And uh, he's, he really has done a lot to support hydrogen and really good clean solid battery technologies around the world. That's Blue Planet Research. Um, Blue Planet Foundation is kind of the sister to Blue Planet Research. Both are headed by Hank Rogers, Mr. Hank Rogers, who's basically has the license to the, the video game Tetris and has used a lot of his resources to promote um, clean technology, hydrogen, um, clean batteries, and even help support um, NASA and, and international space missions with a space habitat on Mauna Loa where astronauts come to train for long duration uh, space days <clears throat> by training on the lava fields of uh, the volcano Mauna Loa in Southern Big Island. Um, my predecessor at HCAT, Mr. Tom Quinn, he kind of led the charge, initial charge on Air Force's foray into hydrogen fuel cell vehicles at HCAT and uh, did some great work there. And the, the gentleman that took my place after I left, um, Dave Molinero, uh, continues along that line and continues to work with the microgrid project, which really, quite frankly, he named it Pearl. And uh, it was his, his whole uh, creativity that brought that uh, acronym into, into place. Um, another HCAT uh, hero is uh, Rachel James, who uh, came to HCAT uh, to have a decent schedule because she was actually working in one of our congressional offices for Tulsi Gabbard. <clears throat> and we stole her away from Tulsi Gabbard's office, uh, even though she was doing great work over there, but her schedule was so intense uh, and she wanted to get her law degree. So we gave her a little bit more flexibility. She got her law degree, uh, worked at HCAT for probably four and a half, five years, and then now is a lawyer at the Public Utilities Commission. So she will continue in the future to help hydrogen move forward um, in, in state government, whether it's at the PUC or whatever her next uh, career is um, as a lawyer going forward. We just call her the governor because she's such a sharp young lady. We figured she's going to be governor sooner or later. Um, we had great support from our parent corporation, uh, the used to be called High Tech Development Corporation, but it's a Hawaii Tech Development Corporation now. And Len and uh, Wayne and all the folks over at um, over in Manoa, and now, now they're actually down <clears throat> um, near the University um, Medical School uh, in a new facility that they, they put together. Um, they've been a great, great support for HCAT. Um, they, they, the biggest support they gave us was they stayed out of our way and kind of let us do what we needed to do with the Air Force. Um, but when it came to legislative support, education, and support services like accounting and stuff, uh, they were always great. They always included us in their career days and things like that so people could learn about hydrogen. Some of the companies that, that actually helped out a lot, um, the first company was Servco, and uh, spearheading that was um, Thor Toma, who, uh, he, he actually um, approached us to learn a little bit more about hydrogen. Um, but then he also, he and the, the whole leadership team at Servco, Servco is a, a big multi-dimensional um, company here in Hawaii. They, they don't just do cars, but they happen to have one of the biggest dealerships here in Hawaii that deals directly with to Toyota Japan. And so Servco brought in not only the first Toyota Mirai, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles to lease commercially here in the state, but they also used their own funding to build the first hydrogen station that was available outside of Hickam and Schofield in the Marine base to provide fuel for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So Thor and the folks at Servco, um, they really gave the commercial side a big boost here in the hydrogen fuel cell world. <clears throat> Um, an, another player was um, Hawaii Gas. Rich DeGarmo was my, my personal um, go-to guy at, at Hawaii Gas. Um, he provided a lot of continuity over the years and listened to me as I tried to preach to him that Hawaii Gas ought to be looking at hydrogen as their future follow-on carbon-free fuel um, here in the islands. He took that to heart. And I think because of him, a lot of the leadership at Hawaii Gas understands hydrogen pretty well now. And I think there's a great future in Hawaii Gas's world for hydrogen. 
uh, one of the folks that really helped us out with the Air Force was a lady named Miranda Ballantyne. Not really well known in Hawaii, but she was known in the Pentagon because she was a, the deputy um, uh, director for um, insulation, energy, uh, and infrastructure. I don't know what her exact title was there, but she ran all the programs at the Air Force Research Lab and Air Force Power Technology Office that we dealt with. And she was a huge supporter, especially of our transition to the flight line of the future and the microgrid project at Hickam. Um, she was an incredible inspiration and she really got the Air Force thinking serious about hydrogen. Um, like I mentioned, AFRO and APTO as two of the agencies over there. Um, they were a little bit of struggle from time to time, depending on who the personalities were, but overall they were really big helps in uh, getting us moving. Um, there are other federal agencies that helped us out a lot too, Department of Energy, um, a nice lady named Sunita Sachapal, who's a PhD and runs basically all of the hydrogen um, projects under the Department of Energy in Washington, DC. She and her whole, whole team um, have always been great supporters of what we're doing in Hawaii and literally made sure that we were involved and engaged in large forums in Washington, D.C. that they were involved in. Uh, many of us, Mitch, myself, made presentations uh, at those forums. Uh, at one time, I was even invited to represent not only the Department of Energy, but the Department of Defense at the federal level at a large meeting um, because she wanted uh, the, the people that we're meeting with to understand that Hawaii was so serious uh, about hydrogen that um, I was the guy that pushed hydrogen in Hawaii and helped the Department of Energy and the US Department of Defense and hydrogen. Uh, some of the other players here, Dave Rolf, the head of the Hawaii Auto Dealers Association, made sure that we got the first uh, Toyota Mirai uh, outside the continental United States delivered into the um, United States and really promoted Hawaii hydrogen and the technology with Servco. Um, Kind of a tough position to be in. He tried to be fair and, and be good with everybody, but uh, he really, really took care of hydrogen as a, as a, um, a topic. Um, some of the legislative folks are really helpful. Is a, a good friend of mine. He was actually in the state legislature before being elected to Congress, Mark Takai, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, but he, when he was in the legislature, he actually helped us out a lot. Um, promoting hydrogen within the state legislature. And then of course, going to Congress, um, he was also very instrumental in helping to make sure that um, Congress uh, understood the benefits of hydrogen. Um, some of our local legislators, Mark Nakashima from the Big Island and Chris Lee from Oahu, um, were also very receptive to learning about hydrogen. And uh, Rep Nakashima is now, um, moved up in the world in the House of Representatives and hopefully will even have a bigger voice supporting hydrogen. Some of the companies that helped us out locally were one of them was called Millennium Rain Energy um, and Chris McWinney. Uh, he actually provided um, Blue Planet Research on the Big Island with some of their equipment. We saw it, we liked it. We ordered some for the Air Force. The Air Force saw it, they liked it. Navy came and visited us and so did the Army. They saw Chris's equipment, and they liked it. So we had a symbiotic relationship with Millennium Rain. We, we saw good things in their equipment and through us, uh, a lot of the DOD and other private sector folks also saw their equipment at, at Blue Planet Research or at HCAT and have uh, made Millennium Rain a, a really successful company with a hopefully very bright future in hydrogen. Um, another company, local company that we really like, and you've actually seen some of their work here on ThinkTech is uh, a company called Hyperspective. They did the three videos that uh, we show to them a lot. And um, they're, they're great, great videos. And uh, we'll continue to show them. I get kudos all the time for US, for, uh, for my Hyperspective. Uh, US Hybrid is uh, the, the company that did all of our our um, transitions from for all of our vehicles to hydrogen. So uh, Abbas Godarzi, the president of the company, um, Todd, Martin, Rusty Hughes, uh, Chris, and even Orlando, who don't work there anymore, uh, did great work and really got things going. 
Um, getting near the end of the list here, um, Greg Barber over at Nelha. Um, he's, he runs the facilities where Mitch's station is. He's always been a great supporter. And, and when he's had a sustainable energy forums on the Big Island, he always makes sure that hydrogen is part of the agenda. And uh, we really thank him for that work. And last but not least, thanks to Jay Fidel, the folks here at ThinkTech who have really helped um, keep hydrogen on the front burner, so to speak, um, and keeping us going. Jay asked me to start doing this show uh, over five years ago. And so every week I've been doing Stand the Energy Man for the last five years and a handful of months. So thanks to Jay, all the folks in the production side, and all the folks uh, that uh, put us together and put us on YouTube and Vimeo. Thank you so much. And really, after Thanksgiving and being locked down for Thanksgiving, I think that's that's fitting that uh, I'd spend, spend some time acknowledging some people who are really instrumental. And of course, I know I missed some, but the key ones I tried to get um, that really made hydrogen a big deal in Hawaii. And in turn, I think Hawaii is going to make hydrogen a big deal in the world. So thanks for joining Stan the Energy Man this week. And until next Tuesday, aloha.